the Cypher Brief, because national security is everyone's business. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the Cypher Brief studio. I'm Suzanne Kelly here with Brad Christian, and it's super nice to have you all back here today. I cannot believe it's December already, um, but apparently this year is just flying by and the news never stops. So it's really good to have you with us today as we talk about information operations. By now, we, at least in this audience, have a very good understanding um, of the basics of how information operations work. And we're gonna be welcoming someone who spends a lot of his time focused on issues like this to get the very latest on who's behind some of these larger operations that we've seen in the headlines lately um, and why they're so effective. Um, and then most importantly, probably the question that we're all asking anytime we talk about information operations, what can we do about it? So before I uh, welcome our guest today, just a few quick announcements and some logistics. For those of you who are focused on cyber issues, we will be announcing our next Cyber Initiatives Group Summit in January. I am very excited about this. Please be sure to check out our free daily newsletter for the latest information on that as we um, announce the dates. I'll just tell you all right now, it's going to be January 27th. Don't tell anyone I told you, um, but we'll be announcing that publicly shortly. For those of you who might not be familiar with the Cyber Initiatives Group yet, um, the Cyber Brief is really building a new kind of ecosystem of cyber experts. It's not just IT professionals. It's not just the computer science folks who are really leading um, the way we're thinking about and dealing with cyber security and cyber issues. It's a whole ecosystem of people. So we're reaching out to a lot of our experts from the public and private sectors to help us reshape the way we think about, the way we communicate, and the way we deal with issues in cyberspace. So check that out at Cyber Initiatives Group dot com if you're interested in that um, and we put together about four summits a year we're going to do one in person next year and then three virtual and it's just the latest and greatest on who's seeing what out there um, how they're dealing with it um, from both public and private sectors all right i'd like to welcome a number of former senior national security leaders to today's session we have a lot of government organizations dialed in today as well, so welcome to you all. We're looking forward to your questions during the session, and we also have a number of journalists with us today, and today's session is on the record, so please feel free to reach out if you have further questions for John after today's session, and we'd be happy to connect you. You can submit your questions to the speaker today by using the link on the control panel, which is probably, if you're on a laptop or a desktop, on the right-hand side of your screen, just check the chat, the chat function there to send your questions in. Um, if you're calling in on your phone, you can always send your questions to Brad. He's at bchristian at thecipherbrief.com. I'd really like to thank Mandiant for their support for this session today and for the work that they're doing on the information operations that helps all of us better understand why this is such an important national security issue. So we've heard about Russian active measures for some time now. Um, a lot of our own Cypher Brief experts are experts in that area when it comes to Russia. But we've also heard that during the height of the pandemic, both Russia and China were spreading disinformation about the virus. There's only so much the government can do about this, and a lot of responsibility, of course, lies with the private sector platforms that share information widely. So if we wanna know just how bad this problem is, all we really have to do is check the daily headlines. Facebook recently said it has taken down, and I checked this number because it didn't sound right, 1.3 billion fake social media accounts in the past couple of months. Now, Twitter said recently that it has closed thousands of China state linked accounts that were spreading propaganda as well. So who are the biggest actors behind information operations today and how are they doing what they're doing? I'd like to welcome John Holquist to help us understand the answer to that question. John leads the Mandiant Threat Intelligence and Analysis team. And prior to that, he worked for FireEye, probably heard of them. He worked for Eyesight Partners, you probably heard of them. So he's been in this private sector information space for quite a while now. In fact, he has over a decade of experience covering emerging threats in cyber espionage and hacktivism and working in senior intelligence analysis positions. Now, before working in cybersecurity, he worked with information sharing and analysis centers and was involved in counterinsurgency operations in the U.S. Army. John, welcome. Hi, Suzanne. Thanks for having me. So nice to have you back here again. I always love seeing what you're seeing and thinking about it in the way that you do because you study this um, so regularly. I thought you might start us off today um, with maybe a brief lesson on information operations from your perspective. What are you seeing now and how should we be thinking about this? So I'm gonna kind of turn the floor over to you and I'm gonna hang out here and we're gonna come back and answer questions in a few minutes. Fantastic. We have those slides. Uh, there we go. 
So uh, before I get even get started, I just wanted to kind of level set. I throw the term around information operations. I am fully aware that there are many different thoughts on what that term means. Uh, uh, I am not, well, I guess I am affiliated with the university, but a adjunct professor, but uh, there's, a, there's a real academic pursuit around this, determining what IO means. But, you know, when we talk about, you know, a lot of the, I guess the US military used to talk about it. They were talking about a really broad, holistic view that included everything from military deception to operational security to CNO, uh, psychological operations, you name it. Um, I think a lot of the times when we're talking about it, or when we when we, people say I/O, they're really talking about, are they using a shorthand, uh, at least in in the sort of open source space uh, for influence uh, or operations that are meant to influence. Uh, those are off, often operations that have like a covert uh, flavor. To, usually, they're covert operations or sort of fall in that space that you know the Russians would call active measures. Um, Generally, we're talking about disinformation versus misinformation. Misinformation being information that's, you know, just wrong. Disinformation being information that's purposely wrong. So there's this purpose, this purpose, somebody's purposely misleading people. Um, and, uh, you know, there are a lot of, you know, I'm going to focus on the sort of uh, digital tools or the, uh, the internet based tools uh, of IO, but there are a lot of different tools that are used. Uh, if you if you get a chance, please read Tom Ridd's book, Active Measures. We're talking about stuff. He's like looking at printing presses in the 1920s. This stuff goes way, way back. Uh, but we're really, for, for our purpose, we're really talking about concerted disinformation. That means opera, large operations with resources that are doing disinformation work. And operations meant to covertly influence in the digital space, the geopolitical import. There are a lot of different players out there, ranging from... Uh, people who just don't know what's going on, who are spreading disinformation purposely to, you know, big governments. Yeah, big governments are in this game. I'm going to focus on the latter. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, just before we started talking, Suzanne and I were, were talking about some of the, the Chinese activity that had come to light recently. Uh, China is developing, uh, you know, a digital I.O. capability. Uh, we've been watching it since 2019. Um, the evolution it actually is very similar to a lot of the uh, cyber espionage capabilities we've seen over the years kind of evolve out of uh, domestic, dis, you know, domestic problems. And we watch them, we literally watch them move, uh, move east out, out over time as they get better, as they start taking on new targets. Uh, as they start developing new tactics. So what started in 2019 was, was Hong Kong focused. It was on a handful of social media sites. Really a language that we saw at all was English and, and, and Chinese languages. Uh, uh, but now this thing is in seven languages. It's on 30 social media platforms. I think we found it in about in over 40 additional uh, sites and platforms. So they're not only just even doing you know, very core social media. They are out and about on all these other social media platforms. They're all over the world. So there are social media platforms that are popular in certain regions. They're on those. And they're on these non-traditional sites that are that offer them a venue to push these narratives as well. So what kind of narratives are they pushing? Uh, next slide, please. Uh, their, their biggest narrative, I think, that you see coming out of this actor are these attempts to portray the United States and the U.S. system, uh, and, and and to a greater or to a lesser extent, the Western system, uh, as in chaos and disorder. So, any opportunity to sort of uh, recognize, you know, uh, issues that the United, that are going on in the United States, they're going to amplify those issues and take advantage of them. That goes from, uh, you know, our issues with racism here, the uh, Capitol riots, uh, even. Even, you know, the, the Texas power outages, they took advantage of that opportunity to basically uh, portray us as, you know, uh, the U.S. system is chaotic. We don't have control of our system, you know, and, and sort of uh, covertly, almost covertly um, compare us to the, the Chinese system, which to them is, is more stable and, and, uh, and, and more reliable. Uh, another thing that they've been pick, they picked up on really strong is Asian racial violence, and they've actually tied that to COVID-19. Now, I think that's a pretty that's actually a pretty clear 
there is a pretty clear tie between the two uh, problems. Um, but they've really picked up on that. And one of the more one of the more uh, you know one of the more uh, aggressive things we've seen from this actor, and one of the it's one of the most aggressive things we've seen. Period is they have used these these Asian racial violence uh, problem to try to put people on the streets in the United States. So what makes this group and this activity so unique is they're literally trying to get protesters out on U.S. streets uh, through through their actions. Uh, so we have seen attempts to physically mobilize pr protesters. The good news is nobody really took the bait, um, but that's okay. They're an IO outfit. So what do they do? They literally just make it up. And so I've got these two pictures here. If you look at, on the right, this was actually the protest or a few people protesting. I can't remember what town this was in. They just grabbed a picture from a real legit protest and then put on their, they put, they changed the signage. Uh, and then it literally started claiming that the protests had happened, that it was uh, violent. I think there was some, they claimed there were some violent interactions and things of that nature. Uh, the other thing that they have really strongly focused on is COVID-19. COVID-19 has been an absolute boon for the IO business, right? Um, if, if it has been uh, there, you know, there is this concept, I guess, of COVID diplomacy going on in the uh, overt world. Well, in, in this space, there's just there's this covert uh, COVID, uh, you know, fight the, the conflict that is going on at the same time. So, uh, this, this actor in particular is really interested in promoting, uh, uh stories of U S military origins, particularly that the, uh, COVID-19 originated from Fort Detrick prior, uh, prior, I think prior to its discovery in China. Uh, they, of course, are attacking claims of, of Chinese lab origins. There are a couple of prominent Chinese individuals who have made those claims. Uh, and they a lot of their activity is specifically uh, about those individuals. Um, they're also doing th the actual disinformation about the side effects of COVID. Uh, they've claimed that COVID causes uh, a death uh, I, I, and a few other and a few other side, serious side effects. Um, and they're also basically taking the opportunity to claim that the United States is not egalitarian and that we are unfairly distributing the vaccine. Uh, and again, that sort of uh, juxtaposes the United States uh, sort of chaotic system against their own. Uh, though, of course, they're also doing pro-PRC foreign policy. I don't know if you saw recently, I believe it was Lithuania had, had made a statement regarding Taiwan. Uh, they jumped on that in instantly. Uh, they're all, you know, they're very focused on on the Taiwan issue, and so we see a lot of activity around that as well. Uh, next slide, please. So here's the good news: uh, they are they're not very good. Like my 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 person, like my the head of IO. I literally was talking about them this morning, and I threw this in the slide because she said it's pretty bad. And that's the that's the good news. They are in seven languages on 40 channels, and they're not that good. Uh, they, you can you can recognize them. That's one of the reasons we're able to to identify it. Uh, uh, and they're they're not they they are they're not very good at blending, and it it does look uh, it does look fake. Uh, um, but uh, they're persistent. Uh, in fact, we've we've on many occasions we have tried to you know the social media companies. Have taken really strong action against this this actor, and that the actor has come back. What that tells us about this actor is that they are extremely well resourced. It takes a lot of resources to continuously come back to be so persistent. It also takes a lot of resources to operate in multiple countries on multiple platforms. So imagine if you're trying to run a covert operation and you've got all these platforms, you've got to have a, basically an approach for each one of these these platforms. Otherwise. You know, otherwise you're gonna you you are uh, you know it's not like a one size fits all situation, and that means and that means they are very well resourced, um, and so we don't know, but we don't know exactly who's doing this. So uh, we we think it's pro PRC. I think it is very likely supported by at some level somehow supported by the the PRC government. But we don't know if it's a contractor. I don't know if this is an M if an MSS unit. I don't know if this is a you know this organization is somehow uh, involved with their more classic uh, classic I/O activity like or or influence activity just like their their own their television channels. Um, but 
it's very much even despite you know these issues there there are issues with that being pretty bad this is an actor worth tracking we do believe that they are getting better they are growing they're clearly well resourced and we think it's only a matter of time before they become a real a, you know serious issue uh next slide please so iran uh iran you know is actually in, in russia for that matter has been around a lot longer. Um, they're probably more advanced than the, the, than the Chinese peers. Uh, the, what there are, they've got a no, there are a number of different operations that we believe are uh, associated with Iran, not just the one that we, we are, you know, there's a couple from China, but uh, we, we can't, um, I, I won't go over all, I won't go over all of them here, but I want to talk about one that we call Liberty Front Press. This, this activity goes back to 2013. Five years before we discovered it, it was already it was already out there. It's pro-Iranian content. That we're talking anti-Saudi, anti-Israel, pro-Palestine. Typically, um, they are uh, obviously very supportive of JCPOA and any political politics that are that are, that are involved in that. Um, Ultimately, this group was what they're basically doing. You, they were a, a handful, or not a handful, a lot of uh, personas on social media, and they were supporting these essentially these fa fictitious, these fictitious press organizations or, or media uh, sites. Uh, and this is something we've seen from Iran actually used not just in in the IO space, but they have all, even done this for espionage. They create these fictitious media sites. Uh, but in this case, this this Liberty Front Press has come back again and again and again with these sites. Uh, we see them targeting the United States with these sites. We see them start targeting the United Kingdom. Um, you can see, for instance, the British Left, which was a site that was designed to uh, target left wing in, in, in the UK. Um, but this is a global operation. Right. These actors are still active, uh, highly active in the Arab world. For instance, we've seen operations that, that operate in Russian language. They're they're attempting to, to sway Russian uh, Russian speakers. It is, it is absolutely a global operation. This has been attributed to the Islamic uh, Republic of Iran broadcasting. That's the that's the group that runs Press TV, which is sort of like the the official uh, Iranian mouthpiece that you probably heard of before. Uh, and the government has come out and say that they have been tied to IRGC. We don't have all the specifics of those ties, but uh, they're, you know, one probably one of the the last one of the real lasting Iranian capabilities that we've we've encountered. Next slide, please. So, I'm outside of just uh, uh, that actor. I wanted to talk about some of the really interesting tactics that we've seen Iran innovate. Iran is absolutely an innovator. Um, you know, even when, even in the cyber espionage space, one of the things I found so interesting about Iran is where they what they lacked in a lot of technical capability, they often made up for with social uh, social engineering, and this really plays into that strength, right? This is like their ability to sort of social their way towards those messages, and and we see it again and again and again with these operators. So we see them th doing things like impersonating politicians and journalists. Some of the time, that's just to basically amplify messages that they want to amplify. But we also see these fake politician or journalist personas used to launder fabrications. So what I mean by that is, so the fake persona will sit, will basically push some kind of fabricated document, and that will then go to a legit or a controlled media outlet. And so they're basically they're, there's it's it's a pretty complex operation that they're running there. Um, we've seen that one of the most interesting things we've seen from these this actor is they have had letters actually published in American newspapers. So on the right here, this is an actual letter that was published on san sanctioning I think the IRGC specifically and how it was bad for America. And it got published. It got published in, uh, I think it was a Texas-based newspaper. Uh, we've seen them solicit interviews, Western and Israeli uh, 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 persons of interest. Uh, so they're actually recording interviews and then distributing them. Uh, and the other thing that we've seen from these actors is we've seen them compromise legitimate media. Uh, some of that is social media, and some of that is uh, the actual sites. So why do you compromise legitimate media? Because 
those are yeah, because you want to take advantage of those legitimate sources to sort of launder your launder your fabricated information or your your disinformation through. Um, that's actually a TTP that we're going to see more and more of. Um, that sort of blended operation is 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 going to be consistently the standard in the future. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, uh, can't talk about Iran without talking about the operations they did during the 2020 elections. They had a variety of highly aggressive operations. I will, I will readily admit, even though we, they were on our radar, I was absolutely surprised with what, how hard they went during the election. Uh, there was the email campaign I think a lot of people have heard of. They were purporting to be the Proud Boys and, and threatening people if they voted Democratic. Uh, they did attempt to, to compromise voter databases. And one of the things that we worked very hard uh, uh, to, to sort of counter was they, they built a, uh, a, a video that uh, demonstrated them hacking sites for voter information, which was actually not real. Like they basically were kind of faking it and generating fraudulent absentee ballots. Uh, the video was uh, like playing to Metallica. It was actually pretty well, pretty interesting, pretty well produced, I, I thought. Uh, it didn't get a lot of airplay, thank goodness, uh, prior to the election, but the point of it really was to undermine uh, faith in the system. They also, and this just very recently came out, they also had access to a media company. And it's for that exact purpose that I just discussed in the last slide there, that access to the media, or at least that's what we believe, that with access to the media company could have allowed them to push information at the last minute uh, that, that and get wide and get wide pickup before somebody maybe had been able to figure out what they had done. Uh, next slide, please. And we can't go through any of these without uh, talking about our our friends from Russia. Uh, the Internet Research Agency that what that I think everybody's heard so much about, uh, the other IRA uh, is still around or is still uh, is their descendants are or organizations that we believe have some connection to the original organization uh two two operations that we think are are potentially related one is called naebc that's a newsroom for american european based citizens uh this group has been focused more on uh, u.s conservative audiences so we see a lot of anti-biden anti-vax anti-fauci anti-beto uh type activity uh what separates them from a lot of their peers is that they're actually going for a lot of uh, alternative social media platforms, whereas some of these actors have you know, had a bit of an uphill battle with the big social media platforms that have taken a lot of action against them. The alternative, you know, the alternative platforms just don't have the same moderation tools, or maybe uninterested or unwilling to to take it take action against these actors. So we definitely see them busy there. Uh, Peace Data would be another good example of this. They actually were focused on U.S. liberal audiences. Um, one of the more interesting things that they did is they actually used real live Western journalists to write all their articles and just sort of push them towards uh, narratives that they felt were, uh, you know, that sort of fit their, 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 the narrative that they were going for. So uh, essentially people were responding to $100, $250 an article uh, job offers and writing articles for them. And these were our US freelance journalists. Next slide, please. Last uh, last but not least, uh, there's an actor that we call Ghost Writer that is really interesting in doing some interesting stuff in, in, uh, in Eastern Europe. Uh, <clears throat> we found Ghost Writer a few years ago. And when we first did, we basically found them targeting NATO in the Baltics and Poland. It didn't get a lot of, I don't think this, activity got a lot of interest because they saw it as focused on uh focused on the baltics and focused on well, i think a lot of our domestic audience saw it as focused on the eastern europe but in fact it's not it, this actor is not focused on eastern europe they were focused on nato so what they were trying to do is essentially create a media environment or create a disinformation environment that was hostile to nato's deployments in those states and so they do things like this fabricated letter on the right here, where they basically, this was a letter that they they created that said that uh, that there was a massive COVID-19 outbreak amongst NATO soldiers, and they were going to have to leave, I think this was uh, Lithuania. 
Uh, they use they use COVID-19 on several different occasions to essentially insinuate that NATO was 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 full of COVID-19 cases, uh, and they were they were essentially bringing them into those states that they that they were uh, the military where military operations were going on. They also claimed that the U.S. soldiers had hit children with their vehicles. I think a striker vehicle that had children. Uh, they claimed you know very they accused them of various crimes. Uh, and what they and I think the probably the worst thing I saw is they'd actually fabricated a picture that basically had a a, uh, a German vehicle and claimed that a German vehicle had desecrated a Jewish cemetery in, in one of the Baltic states. Uh, and they photoshopped the image of this. And so two things they a couple things they would do is one they would reach out the media with this stuff they would uh, push it on social media. But the other probably the most important thing is they were compromising a lot of media sites to place this information on, so it would get it would get strong uh, pickup. Um, <clears throat> uh, ultimately, we were able to we knew that then that they had this hacking element. Ultimately, we were able to learn more about that hack uh, hacking element or that the group that was doing that doing that those network compromises for them. Um, what we saw is that they were doing actually a lot of espionage type activity too. Typical. Uh, government, military, NGOs, typical sort of uh, interests for, for a cyber espionage operation. And they were actually also going after non, non-related geographies or, or sort of more, more a broader set of geographies where they're carrying out that espionage activity. So uh, next slide, please. So uh, so who did it? Who did it? So if you had asked me right at the beginning, I would have said, oh, this is going to end up being Russia. I mean, don't be ridiculous. It's going to end up being Russia. Um, in 2020, though, we noticed that they started to become more focused on Belarusian issues, um, and we took we took a, a strong look at it from that sort of thinking. And what we also found was there was curious targeting of the Baltics. They hit Latvia and Lithuania, but they missed Estonia, uh, where there are you know there there are soldiers as well. We also know that Belarusian TV actually cited Ghost Rider Telegram channel. And most importantly, eventually we had the technical capabilities to in, to determine that they were located in Minsk and had had ties to the Belarusian military. So, uh, so what gives it? That's Belarus, right? Well, other other organizations, particularly the EU, have come forward and said this is actually a Russian capability, and we don't entirely disagree. While we do believe this is a Belarusian capability, we think they're going after Belarusian issues. We think they're about Bel Belarusian individuals, and they're operating out of Belarus. I think it's very it's very possible that Russia is somehow involved, and that could be uh, because this is a, could be a joint operation of some nature, uh, or operators are been are, or pieces of the operation are, are basically coming from Russian hands. We don't know who's creating the malware, for instance. We don't know who's creating the narratives. So uh, this could, this is a really a really interesting operation. Who cares? Well, this operation that's currently focused in 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 Eastern Europe uh, was seen in Germany right before the election there, and they were actually uh, you know very circumspect about it because they were concerned that they could take some action in their election. I am personally concerned about this actor uh, in our next set of elections. Right? We watch these things develop in places like Eastern Europe. And they became they become greater problems for all of us. And I think that's one thing that to, that it's important to, to remember about this whole problem is we have to fo we have to keep a global view of these these issues because tomorrow that problem that was in Hong Kong will be on our doorstep. Uh, that's all my slides, Suzanne. There's so many like really interesting things that you've touched on here. I want to ask you um, though. Um, from a sort of headlines from today and what really Washington has been focused on this week is that phone call between President Biden and President Putin. And there's so much buildup of tension on a geopolitical level around what's going on in Ukraine. And Ukraine has always kind of traditionally been, John, a, a sort of testing ground for a lot of these cyber actors to try things out and, and see what is effective and see what kind of you know, response um, these things generate. Are, are you seeing any sort of uptick in, in operations in Ukraine or would you expect that there would be around, you know, sort of the Russian troop buildup along the border? We've seen some, up, we've seen some uh, activity that, it, the IO activity that is, uh, you know, uh, focus on, uh, focus on the 
the Ukrainian situation that, you know, obviously takes the Russian viewpoint of the problem. Uh, so they are definitely pushing those narratives right now, right? They're, they're, there's, they're clearly interested in that. Um, of course, outside of IO, there, I have no doubt that there's an intelligence, you know, bonanza going on right now when every side is trying to figure out what the other side is thinking. If I were, you know, Russia's leaders right now, I would have serious doubts about what everybody's thinking or serious questions about what everybody's thinking. I expect a ton of espionage to be doing going on uh, of around that. And that sort of stuff, by the way, can also always become an IO operation because of leaks, which are made increasingly, uh, you know, a big piece of this game. So if you have, for instance, let's say they do a big, a big espionage, you know, big espionage uh, push, and they learn that some allied state is has no interest in 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 fighting you know for Ukraine or taking any action or something like that um and they're they're not saying that stuff publicly mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. a leak could change could change you know the course of of the of the conversation and it doesn't have to be <laughs> real it could yeah. be like oh, it, doesn't, yeah, it doesn't even have to be real that's right <laughs> this is the next hollywood movie like i'm telling you i'm I'm hoping that it happens there and not in real life but i'm, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm cynical. <laughs> yes well, you talked about sort of the different actions by Russia, Iran, China. Um, I, I'm wondering if there are any trends that they all seem to be moving towards. I think you said that these blended operations are really the way of the future. Um, yeah, anything yeah. else? Uh, I, yeah, so blended operations, which means um, the, the hacking to basically get on or to, to gain access to a point where they can uh, proliferate their, their narratives, right? So I think we're going to see more social media sites or more, or, 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 when I say social media accounts or more uh, sites being targeted so that they can gain access and proliferate their message. That seems to be, that's not just the Russians doing that, that's the Iranians doing that now. It won't be long before other players are doing it as well. Um, and they, they're they getting better at it. So that's that's only gonna, you know, over time. Leaking is another sort of blended operation, right? You, you, get, you do some cyber espionage, you realize you've got something gold and then you push it through this system, which is basically, you know, your 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 covert uh, your covert means of, of of pushing information, and you use that to basically get it out there. That's just, that's another opportunity they have there. Fabricated yeah. content. Um, that's everything from like Photoshop images. Uh, one of these Russian actors or actors that's very possibly Russian is called Secondary Infection. We actually don't know if they're they're Russian. We suspect as much, but uh, they've done a ton of fabricated content from letters letters involving congressmen to uh you you name it they've created all these fabricated documents they're really into that and it's funny because it's almost exactly the type of of play that you would have actually seen uh 60 years ago during the cold war uh you know they were they were doing the exact same thing just without the computers and so that's that's definitely going to happen we're going to see plenty of that um and the other thing is using real people so if you get keep getting caught you know, and with your interactions to the, the space or you don't look legitimate, the, one of the solutions to that is to start hiring real people who just don't know that they are cutouts, right, or, or in between all, all of this. And, and I think we're going to just see a lot more of that. It's always in their interest to use somebody, some unwitting uh, unwitting person in the, mid, in the middle uh, it, to, to basically hide their hand. And honestly, I worry a lot being a journalist for my entire career, John. I worry a lot um, and I think we should do a separate session just for journalists. Like, how do you, um, especially in this world where a lot of people aren't meeting face to face anymore, like we don't have the good old days of journalism where you'd meet in some dark, you know, alley somewhere to get information. I mean, a lot of it's being done electronically. You can't verify sort of your sources in the same way. So yeah. I do think, you know, I see the future of this blended threat um, in a very similar way from a different perspective uh, that you do. And how do people, I mean, how do people fight this kind of thing? It's, it, it, it's, uh, over, it's overwhelming, it's really and to be honest. It's a really, it, it ain't easy. So, um, you know, you know, I keep talking about these adversaries who have managed to overcome a lot of our efforts. So our efforts are, you know, we're doing domain seizures, uh, social media bans and takedowns, um, uh, but these actors continue to persist. I think it's important to do, I'll take, it's important to do all those things and to do them as quickly as possible. That that usually means that the U.S. government is gonna have to step in, not to necessarily do them, but to provide information based on their intelligence 
uh, to make sure this happens faster and faster. And it's actually similar to the ransomware problem. I, I think it's a structural problem. It's not going to just go away just because we started fighting it. Um, but uh, there are there are all these opportunities to, to move faster. The other thing is uh, there is a market, a gray market for accounts for social media. We have mm -hmm. got to target that space. That, one of the reasons these guys are able to set back up is to then go out and buy more accounts and get back get back up in, online in no time. That, so will you break that down for me? Just so so what is that gray market? Like what does that mean when I want to go and you know if I'm a bad actor and I want to go buy something? Website, you can pay with a regular credit card, by the way. You don't need Bitcoin or anything fancy. You go to a website and you buy a ton of accounts, which you then control. Uh, and essentially you then rename them or whatever and pretend like you know you're you hate Beto or whatever it is that you're trying to you're trying to push. And uh, and that's like it's a huge opportunity for them. Somebody, we, there's an opportunity there for somebody to step in, I think. And uh, and also, you know, you mentioned that the journalists, right? So journalists have to be really, I think, careful in this environment. Um, you know, there was there were actors in 2016. There were actors who were trying to sell uh, fictitious information, and people, a lot of a lot of journalists said no, and they recognized something was off. But eventually they got through. Uh, that, I mean, I, I would give my hats off to the ones who, who were able to recognize something was wrong. But we need to make, almost improve training and, and, and get, get them in a position where they can vet that. You know, one of the very things that made me very happy is I, we, I actually get to vet, or I don't do it, my team does it, bring the things that come in from journalists all the time. And we could tell them, look, this looks shady. Don't, don't touch it. Right. I think that journalists need to find some kind of partner who can help them uh, vet those sorts of things so they can keep them out of the you know, keep them away from them. Um, Especially though, you know what we're really concerned with is we're living in this age of anonymous sources, right? Like journalists yeah. bank on anonymous sources because yeah. they don't have to have a tie. Um, if you know the information, uh, you know they, they're somehow using the cover, and, and a lot of times it's true. They might lose their jobs if they if people know they share it or whatever, and there are legitimate reasons for being an anonymous source. But it does make it a lot harder, I think, um, for journalists to do their job and really vet those sources thoroughly. So it's interesting to your point. I hadn't thought that maybe that would be where the future is trending as well to have a private sector partner to help do a little sort of research and, and some vetting of, of some of these sources. And there's, there's just a real ethical problem there. I mean, if you're yeah. a journalist and let's say this, um, this situation is going on with the, the during the elections, right? You know yeah. something has happened. They haven't got to the bottom of it. You know it's fishy. Do you go out and say, hey, somebody's distributing this video of them hacking all these election sites, or do you wait until you can figure out who, who's doing it and what, what's going on there? Yeah. Um, and those are really important. It's really important to have those ask those questions because otherwise you could just be giving oxygen to the, yeah. the operation. The best thing they can do in a lot of cases is make this movement from their fabricated nonsense into the real world, right? Into into somebody's hands who could really push it. Um, and that's why operators, by the way, uh, uh, there was something called DC leaks before there was Guccifer 2.0. Uh, mm -hmm. There was something called DC leaks, and before that was even called election leaks, and mm -hmm. it didn't really play. It didn't really get the pickup they wanted, so it ended up with the data ended up in the hands of WikiLeaks, right? Mm -hmm. They went for somebody who they knew would push their stuff and get it out further. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and journalists don't want to be in that position. Man, this is depressing, <laughs> but really important that we understand this better so that we have some chance, frankly, to yeah, identify. I, I, think, I think understanding this is like is is our best. Uh, security, right? In 2016, people, I, I kid you not, there was a massive conversation amongst very legitimate people that this, the Russians would never do something like this, right? Or this seems absurd or unlikely. Um, yeah. We got, we have to move past that point to the point where we're having conversations about, yeah, this is very likely because they did it this time, or they did that this time, or this is very similar to that other thing they did, so that we can, so that we're actually prepared. It's, it inoculates us against the operation. I think it was your boss, Kevin Mandia, who I was talking with not very long ago, um, John, who also said, hey, the Russians are really good at this and don't expect that they're not gonna keep innovating. So yeah. when you think you yeah. finally caught up, you know, I mean, they're smart people, they're not. They're very they're good. good, they're very good. Yeah. I mean, when it comes to active measures, uh, I mean, Tom, like, I've got Tom Red's book over here and I like yeah. pull it up all the time because I like to see a cyber thing and it's essentially something, some operation they ran in the 20s 
or whatever that they've like refitted and, and cyberized and they're just running again. So because I mean, we're all, all these, human and we all buy into the same bait that we did. Yeah, just yeah. All right, let me stop. Um, let me stop taking up all the time for all my own questions because I'm fascinated by this. But we have some questions coming in from folks who are listening in as well. So Robert Orr says, John, thanks so much for your presentation. What can people concerned with these issues do to discern misinformation or disinformation from legitimate information if we don't really have ready access to technical tools to determine attribution or more deep analysis? So what he's saying is not everybody sits where you do and yeah, has this amazing team around you, know right? What about the rest I readily of us? admit that. And and I think uh, I mean your nose is the best the best place to start, right? Like I, I would I. I'd, so that you know one of the the downsides of social media is we get a lot of information from unclear sources and we and we pass them along and i can tell you i have done it i have caught myself doing i mean i've been on every stage of that problem uh it's very easy uh to get caught but the only way the only you know the solution is, is honestly is to be uh con constantly uh suspicious of the of the source of information if something smells wrong don't share it right yeah. and 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 figure it out or go look for another source or look for a legitimate source somebody who adds that the resources uh i i personally think journalists have the resources to check to check uh check on sources not all of them are going to do that i'll admit but a lot of them will find a source that will do that you stick know. with the credible news organizations yes, because they do still follow the old rules of journalism and there are rules in journalism believe it or not yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you don't obviously don't want to go to uh, Liberty Front Press, right? Yeah, no. that's, that's their that's their organization, no. right? So <laughs> you got to you got to look go for a credible organization that, with a name you know, and then I yeah. and then I, and then you, you'd be good to go. And one of the things you know, I think that analysts do often, and the journalists, and they have this in common, is you don't just take one source. And and you now, as the receiver of information of social media, mm -hmm. are almost your own vetting process. So you, you've yeah. got to go out and see, you know. Who else is reporting this? Where else am I seeing it? You know, is, is it a credible source? Um, is it more than one source? I think those are important questions to ask as well. But um, okay, Paul Vivian says, how should the US best organize itself to counter disinformation? This is a favorite question for years now. And we were just in Sea Island together at the Cyber Brief Threat Conference and um, Jen Easterly was down there, director of CISA. They're looking hard at how to organize um, to counter disinformation as well. What are your thoughts on this? So. Uh so I think there's two two questions. One is just setting up to counter disinformation. Uh, I think CISA has already shown a ton of leadership in that space, and I think it, they're they're phenomenal at working with the private sector, uh, which I think this is problem is absolutely you can't you just can't do it without working with the private sector, right? And it in an almost non regulatory manner, uh, I think they're in just a really good position to do that. Um, but the other thing is, I, the, the, I think the other thing is, is that we need to probably as, as a country start thinking about communication as, as, as part of a bigger great power competition problem, right? Uh, and, cyber, and cyber as a whole and information operations as a whole as sort of all this competition that we're doing just short of war and start developing actually a, a more holistic approach to all these problems, uh, as well as our own strategic communications, uh, because our strategic communications are, have, have got to be essentially uh, breaking uh, the other side of this, right? If, if somebody's out there poisoning everybody's minds that, you know, COVID-19 is, you know, was coming from Fort Detrick, somebody's got to be on the other side of that. And, and then we have to do that as well. And that could be, a you know, everything from a public affairs responsibility to a much yeah. grander uh, capability. But I think that we have to get there and we have to get there soon. Jim Clapper has, has been on the Cypher Brief um, really advocating for you know a separate government entity um, and you can park it wherever you want to park it, but yeah. to focus only on communicating this issue. But then again, there's the issue of like, not everybody trusts the government, right? So yeah. darn. Yeah, well, what it's true. I, and I know that's, that's tough, but I, I don't think we're going to move forward unless we have abil some ability to communicate as a, as a country. Yeah. Or we're going to win uh, this, right, this totally. competition. Um, Larry Pfeiffer. Hey, Larry. It's great to see you here. Um, Larry says, clearly the volume of this type of misinformation is increasing beyond the capabilities of the U.S. government and perhaps companies like Mandiant. How do you prioritize your targets with respect to your resources? 
That's a good question. That's a really good question. So I don't have unlimited resources uh, to, to target this problem. So we typically look for the ones that we think are the, 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 the most, uh, let's say the most dangerous uh, to, to uh, represent the greatest threat. And I think that the ones that are do that are the ones that are tied to things like elections or, you know, elections, uh, yeah. the ones that are, are associated with the, the major antagonistic actors who, uh, who basically represent a global threat, um, mm -hmm. at least it, it have continuously threatened our, our, um, our customers and, and, and as a, as a whole, our democracy, um, mm -hmm. there are so many actors out there. So there are IO operations being done for mayoral races in Latin America. Now they are like, like when I say IO, I mean this, this type of IO, but uh, yeah. they are, there are operations that have been created to support the sale of t-shirts. Um, mm -hmm. the, the, we have seen, I have recently seen a ransomware operator doing very IO like activity uh, to essentially shame some people into paying the ransom. Um, it, there's a ton, there's a ton out there, but, but we focus generally on the big players, and the ones that we think are going to, going to cause the most, the most harm. So are you looking at kind of with that national security kind of lens in mind, like these are the ones who could actually impact the national yeah. security of the United States? Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Um, okay, Brad, uh, our own Brad Christian has a question. He says, the U.S. the US is a much softer and easier target for information operations relative to the societies of our autocratic adversaries. We talked Absolutely. about that a lot, especially combining active measures with advanced technologies. Should the U.S. government take a more active role, perhaps by declassifying some information faster to help uh, educate all Americans, right? Not just private sector, yes. all Americans about these threats faster. That Brad, you're speaking my language. So yes, I I absolutely agree with that. So one of the so here's here's what happened in 2016. These guys attacked, and uh, the media, which has always been trained to sort of both sides things, right? Yes. Uh, that did they was it the Russians? Was it not the Russians? Yes. And the information was there. Just we just couldn't declassify it fast enough. And so yeah, they took advantage of the system our institutions, they recognize that our lack of control over the information environment is an opportunity for them, right? And they are absolutely taking advantage of that. And one of the ways I think we, Brad, I 100%, I know I saw that dog, Black Rock. I know. One of, the ways we can, one of the ways that we can fight that is getting that information out there as fast as possible. The government is, is clearly speeding up their approach, but it's just not, it's just not fast enough. Um, yeah. that we need to be outing these things as we find them uh, and, 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 and making sure that everybody knows what's happening. It needs to be as fast as that puppy behind you, a super cute puppy, by the way. <laughs> I'm so glad we have a question here from Thomas Drohan, and it's something I wanted to ask you about as well, which has to do with artificial intelligence. So um, his question is, how do we counter an attack um, AI from de facto great powers that write messages and, and, and kind of its own code and supportive narratives to undermine democratic values. So, so basically, once you layer on the ability of AI mm -hmm. into this like mess of a situation we have already, how much more is that going to complicate it? Oh, well, so uh, they are using, I guess, not AI, like machine learning, the, the GAN images, right? The, the fake faces you see. So that is actually being used. In fact, it's being used by a ton of different adversaries. Uh, the good news is it actually represents an opportunity because if you can detect GAN images, you can start looking for accounts that are using them and give them a second look. So uh, it's it's an opportunity and it, for them, and it's also potentially a, a tell that we can take okay. advantage of, right? Uh, until uh, machine learning is 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 really good, you know, is 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 undetectable, which I think will take a long time. Um, yeah. it, the speed it is, is still a factor there What's because that? you. Is speed is still going to be the factor there because you need yeah. to be able to detect those images quickly enough so that you know before they have the impact that they're everything trying comes to. down to speed in that equation for them they want all that stuff so they can automate faster right so i want to be able to produce a ton of uh pictures uh whatever that are that don't come back to anything and i can do that by by spitting them out of the gan and stuff or and i think this is the biggest fear that we have now is that i want to be able to create biographies Mm -hmm. right that uh, or sort of backgrounds or personas and i want to have as much inf information around them that that they look legitimate 
Yeah. Uh, the problem is that speed, you know, at that speed, you're also making a ton of mistakes. The grief yeah. ransomware guys that we were just talking about, one of the interesting things is they actually had, we think is some sort of, uh, uh, I don't know if it was AI or machine learning ge generated content on, on some of their social media. We think they did that to basically set up the site and, and make it look legitimate while they, you know, before they went out and started using it for the other purposes, which was a shame, uh, shame their targets. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's it's got its upsides, it's got its downsides. Uh, but I think really the, the biggest thing is it's being used to make personas look legitimate. Mm -hmm. uh, and, mm -hmm. and, and, and it could help them scale their operations that way. Mm -hmm. Okay, so here's a question for you from Kyle Smith. Um, we talked, um, John, off the beginning with just some of the numbers from Facebook and Twitter and the things that these, you know, social media companies are doing. It's costing them a lot of money to do this. Yeah. And yeah. Kyle's question is, in your opinion, what is the best approach for incentivizing these private companies to scrub or remove the content of the threat actors from these platforms? He says, obviously, more viewers and users is a benefit for these platforms. So what's the true incentive here? Um, I think that I think that the you know the the U.S. government is is you know currently working with these 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 places. Yeah. They're full of people that came out of the same place as I did when I was at the government. I've known a lot. Actually, I've worked with a bunch of them. They've gone over there and started working to to pull all that all the you know pull these actors out of the system. They're doing a ton of work. It is a growing and difficult problem uh, uh, that is uh, that it, I don't know if it's entirely on on them i think yeah. the u.s government has to step up as far as intelligence and and, and giving the information until yeah. the usg honestly can say i mean it's like ransomware right it's like the payment right i would love for nobody to be able to have to have to pay for ransomware but nobody's offering me enough protection until that you know I, I need a certain level of protection we're not there yet we're just not there it's still too much of a problem i think it's the same yeah. thing before the USG starts asking, you know, why can't you get these things off your platform? I think there has to be a, a question of why can't the USG stay ahead of it themselves? It's a, mm -hmm. and it's a nation state level problem, mm -hmm. right? I love, I mean, it, my customers every day struggle with, you know, cyber espionage, for instance, it's mm -hmm. a nation state level problem. And they're doing, honestly, doing the best they can with a, with, with fighting actors like the GRU, the, the IRGC, these aren't, you know, companies weren't built to 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 deal with these things. No, of definitely not. The, you know, really, I, the government has to step up and, and essentially aid them. Yeah, and I hate to end on a depressing note, but I have this question for you, and then I'm going to come to you for some closing thoughts. But oh, yeah. but is this just a game? Yeah. yeah, is this just a game, John, for the big players like Russia, Iran, and China? No, I don't think it's just a game. I think there's two things that they're doing. Uh, one is it's just like PR. One, it's on a, in the simplest form. It's just a covert means of PR, right? Like uh, this is like taking out an ad in the in the New York Times, or whatever. But just a different means of basically pushing that message. And then all those all those sort of sort of investments, uh, hopefully for them, or they hope, will will turn will, will persuade over time. Uh, but the other piece of this, and then the thing that keeps me up late at night is this is a an erosion of our institutions or an attack on our institutions it, mm -hmm. it is them corrupting our democratic process our elections and that's mm -hmm. what we have to be really worried about that mm -hmm. the, mm -hmm. that uh fake proud boys stuff uh it wasn't really about um you know like getting one person to vote one way or the other it was about getting people not to trust the institution um, you know, when you look at the Chinese stuff that I just talked about, the foreign policy stuff, okay, maybe that's about persuading people to support or not support Taiwan, but the the the, the pushing all the stuff around uh, the, the the capital incident, that's yeah. about telling, right. uh, convincing, trying to convince people that our system doesn't work. Mm -hmm. That's what scares scares me more than anything. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, closing thoughts. Let's can we do we have anything positive to talk about? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm glad we all know a lot more about this. Um, yeah. I think it's really that's step one, right? Educate yeah. yourself. Step one. Here's the good news. All right, here's the good news. The good news is, is that there are a ton, I know a ton of really smart people 
who are, are like um, diving into this problem. I teach at Georgetown. Uh, every year I've got somebody in my class who's like, I want to go attack this problem. These young, brilliant people who are internet natives, right? Like they had the, the internet's been around their entire life. They live in this, pro this space. They totally understand it. They, they are, 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 you know, getting into attacking this, but this is going to be an area of competition. Um, but the good news is that we own, you know, like social media companies, a lot of them uh, live, you know, live right here in the United States. A lot of them are, are building out, you know, capabilities to fight this problem. Um, and, and, you know, they're still, they're still not that great. Like my, I think, what did you say? They're not, are they're bad. Uh, uh, like my uh, IO, they're not always, you know, uh, incredible capabilities. They're still uh, trying to get it together. They still get recognized. The Proud Boy stuff still got recognized uh, for yeah. what it was and, and pretty much squashed. Uh, so, you know, we had a big success in 2020, I think. Uh, mm -hmm. Iran came at us with both barrels with a lot of different operations, and we recognized who did it. We outed them immediately. Uh, we didn't l allow that Proud Boys video to get all, or the uh, the election video didn't get very far. Nobody didn't get pick up. So we've had some successes and we should build on those. Very glad too that uh, the government decided to go public with that and make it yeah. a big deal because I, I do think- it's always been doing. <laughs> right, yeah, absolutely right. Well, thank you so much, um, John. This has been a fascinating conversation. I think I told you, you know, when, when I welcomed you on the call, I always learned so much from you. And I think it's really um, important insight for us to be able to kind of see just a little bit into the world that you operate in every day and how you're seeing these things evolve. Um, so very, very grateful um, to you and to Mandiant for today's kind of master class look at information operations and for supporting um, conversations like this. I think sharing this information broadly is a true sign of leadership in this new world we're living in. So my thanks to both you and to Mandy and for today's session. Thanks for having me. Um, all right, so just a quick reminder as well. Um, John's boss is one of the principals of our new cyber initiatives group. If you don't know about it yet um, and you're trying to figure all these things out along with the rest of us, please check it out, cyberinitiativesgroup.com. We're looking forward to welcoming you to um, our summit. It's free. Um, we are genuinely trying to share this information with as many people as possible, and that'll be at the end of January. So check that out. And we look forward to seeing you back here next time in the Cypher Brief studio. So thanks for spending an hour of your time with us today. We appreciate it. We'll see you next time, John. Get back to work. You're busy. All right, thanks. <laughs>